Each cell has a cell leader and cell members. The cell leader is like a, a quarterback of the football team. They're not the coach, they're not the owner. They're a working team member who helps um, raise issues to the surface, make sure uh, uh, we're moving people around to facilitate flow manufacturing, raising any constraints to our production planners or, or anything along those lines. Any order you see with a piece of paper tape like this is a sales order, it's a configured unit that we're gonna ship today. Um, so our planners just have to do one transaction, then these will wheel out to shipping. This is one bandwidth cell. We, we internally call it Superjet, but it, it's the WaveSurfer 3000 line. Coming on down the, down the road, <coughs> here, here um, we can actually look through and you can see some things going on here. This particular bay makes a, um, a, a Wave Runner and a, a, a Wave Surfer 10, which is the current product. It's the oldest mid bandwidth product we have that we manufacture today. So what we have Christina do is making what we call the front box and testing the front box. When she's done, they'll go on the rack behind her. So those are assembled and tested, um, what we call front box. It's a display, touch screen, um, and um, there's, there's a little board on the back of that. So that's a staging area. Mark is building uh, what we call the back box. The back box is the computer, the power supply, and the interface cards we need. And again, he will power that up and test it like a computer. So now we have a tested back box, we have a tested front box. We'll have an acquisition system. That's HLA coming forward. They get married together in this location and, and, move, and move down the road. Um, this particular cell is, is the, the cell that makes the unit we just saw, the Magellan with the rotating display, the, the HRO class oscilloscope. Similar processes, their, their benches run this way. So we have, we have Malin who's doing final assembly of the complete unit. Test, Robert's doing a test of that card down the other end. Flow comes this way. And we want this flow to come here, this flow to come this way. This last cell does the, the, um, the, uh, the HDO the HDO 6000, HDO 4000, and the HDO 8000, the eight channel oscilloscope. The eight channel oscilloscope has two acquisition cards. One standing vertical with the BNCs coming this way. The other one is horizontal with the BNCs coming out. And that's how we get the eight channels. We put two acquisition cards in there. What, what Billy's doing is he's taking the unit that's just been assembled and he's powering it up like an oscilloscope. We'll put it on the internet. We'll, uh, I'm sorry, the other thing I didn't note is we also have a hard drive in every one because you need that for the computer. There was one in the scope we saw. So we gang image those hard drives. We have an imager that'll gang 12 of them at a time. The reality is that image doesn't have the latest Windows updates. Windows updates come out every Tuesday. So every scope, at this point, we put the latest Windows um, updates on it. Other than being on the internet for the Windows updates, we have isolated networks to try to prevent viruses and so forth. Every scope gets a virus scanned right before it ships out the door. The reality is if we have a scare, it typically comes from a USB key, not from anything else except USB keys. Because you take them home, you put them in your kid's computer, you bring them upstairs, you know. So um, as a corporation, Teledyne is going to go to um, a USB key that'll have antivirus running on it in total. No longer are we just gonna be able to get, buy one at Staples and use it, we're gonna take them all off the floor and, and spend the money to have uh, antivirus running on every USB key that we use within this building. Just another layer of uh, security to, to help uh, help prevent issues. Okay, so we built the scope, we have it built, uh, updated, looks good, running like the scope. Then then we run into one of our quality um, quality parts. And here we call it we call it burn in or run in. What we do is every mid bandwidth scope runs 12 and a half hours cycling on and off with power. So these units have been started today. Tomorrow morning they will come off, assuming there's no issues on them, and, and, and most times they're not. We used to have a big walk in burn in oven that would cycle between 5 and 40 degrees C, but the reality is we were not seeing any failures when we were doing thermal cycling. Thermal cycling is a very old military thing that came out in the late 60s, early 70s when soldering technology was in its infancy and that oven would expand and contract the solder joints and if there's a bad one, hopefully it would make it break and therefore the scope wouldn't work. Solder joints don't break nowadays. You get a good solid manufacturer with good manufacturing controls, solder joints don't break. What we see is we'll see infant mortality of components. I don't need thermal cycling for that. Powering and running does it. So here the units will um, power up, power down, uh, about once every five minutes. We'll run at 12 and a half hours minimum. So anything built today goes into burn-in tonight. Can you, 
were you power cycling and thermal cycling or just thermal cycling? Oh, we were doing both at the time. Oh, yeah, it was intense. It was intense. Could have done that. Yeah, and um, lot, you know, we, we didn't need any heaters in the oven. We needed cooling because the units would throw off so much heat themselves. The temperature would go. We were always running cooling. It's just how much do you run if you wanted to get them to five degrees? Um, so for mid-bandless scopes, I can conceivably, conceivably build one and ship one in two days. Get it to this point today, let this run overnight. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow run it on CalSoft, which is what we have here. CalSoft is short for calibration software. Every mid-bandwidth scope goes through CalSoft. Every mid-bandwidth scope can run on any one of these CalSoft stations. It's a automated test setup where we put in a, uh, a, a known signal into channel one. We digitize it, store it to memory, read it out to a computer, and the output needs to match the input. And if the output doesn't match the input, there are some software adjustments that the system will automatically do. And if it looks good, then using a, a precision a pickering switch box, we'll switch that signal to channel two. Bring it in, digitize it, store it, read it out, make sure it works. One, two, three, four, change the volts per division, you know, change the time base, run it again. So there are thousands of measurements going on here. And this is our performance verification. When we say, uh, you know, uh, we're, we've got a, uh, a, a you know, a, we're, we're going to be within, you know, 10 millivolts plus or minus 1%, here is where we guarantee that it happened. The result of that test process with all of the data about which signal generator was used to run the test, what the calibration dates were for that test equipment, really, so that it's all traceable back to, uh, back to calibrated standards. They go over here and go into finished goods. So, so these scopes we, we see here are part of our finished goods inventory. These are built, again, to their highest common denominator. Um, at this point, <clears throat> what we do is we'll take a sales order, match it up to the right unit, and do final quality control and configure to order. And we're going to keep coming around to what we call lockup, which is here. So, so even here, we use the cell-based uh, methodology. T.J. Weinheimer has been here north of 20 years, right? North of 30. North of 30, OK. So he's got me beat. Uh, I'm 27. He's 30. Been here a long time. We've worked together a long time. T.J. is our lockup cell leader. Um, people in lockup are the last ones to power on a scope, use it like a customer. Because the reality is CalSoft does not use it like a customer. You know, it's not looking at the screen. It's not turning the knobs. It's not, you know, touching the touch screen. So here, we use the scope like the customer. We power it on. We store it in memory. We recall from memory. If it's shipping with probes, even though the probes are fully tested, we plug, plug the probe onto the oscilloscope, make sure it's recognized, making sure it's passing the signal. Um, quality is, is not a singular event. It's a layering event. Okay, and with these layers, we I think we do I think we do pretty good. Um, so we have tested probes, but then again, if they're match up with a specific sales order, we'll test them again with that scope. Now, if you order just the probe by itself and you're not running with a scope, I have no problem just shipping it out of finished goods because it's already a tested instrument. But there's nothing like putting every probe on the scope it's going to ship with. You can choose whatever uh, the sales order is asking for. Now I could do it two ways. I could easily do it manually or I can scan the barcode. Yeah. So all I have to do is just put the cursor there and then scan. We're like Amazon.com. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then once I enter the sales order, all I have to do is just press this button and Now killed. So all I have to do is just confirm all the ones that are checked. Uh, code measure, which is the another name for the product bus that's already been checked. DBA or DBAI, and then EMD, which consists of three softwares: the I squared C, the VIN, I mean uh, SPI, and UART. So all of them are all yeah. selected. Now that all the softwares are selected, all I have to do is post a key request, meaning asking the server to send it to me, which I get a confirmation that the 
have been sent. Wow. The option keys are not in the form of this sort, but it will be in the form of text. Right, yeah. yep. Now that they are all there, all you have to do is send it to the DSO which is the Protobus, which is another name for the decode measure, and the DAI, which is that one. EMB consists of the three softwares, I squared C, SPI. Doing the extra things that have to be done to the board before it can actually even be turned on and tested. So right now it looks like she's attaching a clock cable. Is that what you're doing, Christina? Yes. Right? So there's a clock that runs inside the system that's you got to keep that clock signal extremely clean so that's actually run on the top of the board on a I know a I tore cable. it down <laughs> I think I remember watching your video actually <laughs> and I overheard Mark say that yeah we have yep, watched it that, that's my video yes uh, so really this is what we would call the this is a higher level assembly process that's so taking that printed circuit card and doing all the things that we have to do to be able to turn it on that includes things like heat sinks you can't turn them on without the heat sinks otherwise you end up overheating the chips and you actually, the board will turn itself off. So step one, we're just going to do the HLA assembly work. Christina, how long does it take you to do the assembly work on this it's board? It's about 15, 17 minutes. 17 minutes. Yeah. Okay. There's so, a few steps, the cable, then it's another cable, and then uh, installing different shapes of uh, heat sinks. Great. Which are not using the adhesive. So it's a process, so they have to set and dry out. They're now in a queue where they're going to come over to Robert. Robert, you want to say hi? Hello. Hey, this is Robert. Robert Flynn. Um, Robert's the technician, really, for this whole cell. Um, so Robert's going to go through a couple of things. He's going to take that board that Christina built up. Step one, we're going to program it. There are some microcontrollers on the board that have to be programmed, power on micros, other housekeeping and control micros. So the first thing he's going to do is get that programmed. So that's what he's doing at this station right here. After that, you want to pop over to the... Uh, yeah. Front end tweaking tape. So, you know, an oscilloscope's got an incredibly high gain and precise amplifier on the front end of each of the channels. And um, each one of those amplifiers has to be tweaked in order to get it exactly into the performance range that we, that we want. And that's really what you're seeing here. Um, this, is, this is now where we're going to be able to power this board on. And you can actually see on the screen up there, at this point, it's actually running as an oscilloscope. So we've paired that uh, digitizer board up with a PC system, and now we're actually able to acquire a signal on there, and Robert's able to do some of the testing and tweaking that he's got to do in order to front end test and tweak. 15 minutes? 15 minutes or so. And right now you don't have a signal going into the board. Do you no. Put a, okay. So what are you tweaking for, Robert? The uh, gain of the FET in each channel. Okay. So we've got some gain tweaking. And pretty soon, once he's done with what he's got to get done, we move on to the next step of the process here. While well, we're here, we'll show you what it looks like with the signal is. One of the reasons he's bouncing back and forth, you can imagine there are multiple pathways on an oscilloscope right. front end, right? You got a 50 ohm path, you got a 1 meg ohm path, um, you have divide by 1 path, divide by 10 path, divide by 100 path, so he's got to do a tweak on on, uh, on several different paths. And really, this is about now getting it within that mask. So, stuff, right? this is us actually using our own oscilloscope. That's so funny. <laughs> but hey, using whatever our own works, oscilloscope right? to do the mask tweaking um, for the board.